Okay, everybody, it is nine o'clock, and I think we should go ahead and start uh, to keep on time. I'm glad to see uh, so many of you here this morning, uh, having made it through uh, to the Friday, uh, Saturday morning of Mises U. Uh, probably we can find a few more bodies, you know, in the gutter near the, near the bar downtown. We'll go retrieve them later. Um, uh, one thing is, uh, I hope that you've been uh, checking reminders and so on on the, the Mises Academy page for Mises U about getting copies of the PowerPoint slides. So most of the faculty who have used these kinds of visuals have made them available for you to access on uh, the Mises Academy course page for Mises U. Have people been able to access those? Have you tried? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for example, in, in, in the case of my talks, um, you don't have to write down every quotation or, or you know, check the spelling of every name or whatever, because you can just download the entire uh, PowerPoint file as a PDF and have it for your collection. That doesn't mean you shouldn't take notes but it just means you can be uh, judicious in what you write down. Um, I, I will say that um, a couple years ago, I made my, uh, the actual PowerPoint files themselves available to the other faculty, because uh, we were gonna sort of see what everybody else was doing and make sure we were all on the same page. And I noticed that a couple of the other faculty members uh, stole my PowerPoint template. So Professor Herbner, for example, has been using the same fonts and footers and colors and so on that I use. <laughs> Not, not, as, not as well, but uh, <laughs> in an attempt to imitate my style. So, of course, I, I, uh, we all recognize this as a theft of intellectual property. <laughs> and I've already retained Stephen Kinsella as my attorney uh, in my legal case against Herbner to make him stop using my PowerPoint template. Um, anyway, speaking of PowerPoint, uh, this morning's talk is about technology, uh, not educational technology per se, but a variety of issues associated with the relationship between technology and economics. Now, one of the reasons that that's important is because, um, you know, over the last decade or two, with the internet revolution, uh, you know, the rise of what some people call the knowledge-based economy or the networked economy, there's, there's often a lot of discussion about how things are so radically different the way goods and services are produced, the way people interact with each other, you know, the nature of exchange and so on is so radically different that these old models, old theories that we have about prices, about uh, exchange, about the division of labor, about production, you know, a lot of the stuff that you've been learning about this week is somehow obsolete or is at least less relevant than it was before, right? That yes, you know, Carl Manger and uh, Ludwig von Mises and, and, and Murray Rothbard and these guys, they developed their theories in the age of the old economy, you know, the manufacturing economy, the brick and mortar economy. And now that the economy is so new, maybe those theories don't apply anymore. Maybe uh, Mises was wrong about the laws of praxeology being universally valid. Maybe they only apply to specific times and places, and we need a new body of theory now. Um, you know, what are some of the characteristics of this so-called new economy, knowledge-based economy, networked economy? Uh, some people have gone so far as to say that, well, maybe even scarcity is a thing of the past. I mean, it's true. I, if those of you who were in the panel discussion last night, the upstairs panel, there was one, one uh, I think after the break, someone asked a question about, you know, a kind of a future society where we have robots and artificial intelligence and nanotechnology or something such that basically we can just have whatever we want assembled out of molecules or something. You know, would that mean the end of scarcity? And there was some discussion uh, arguing that no, there would still be scarcity. I won't repeat it exactly because Walter Block's answer involved uh, a blow up Marilyn Monroe doll and I don't want to go there. but. Um, but you, but you do hear these kinds of claims that maybe scarcity at least isn't such a big deal anymore. You know, knowledge is a resource and knowledge isn't scarce. We can copy it at no cost and so on. So, so why do we even need economic laws that deal with the world of scarcity? Um, there's a lot of emphasis, a lot of discussion on knowledge. Uh, claims that knowledge is somehow more important today than it was in the past. You know, I mean, right away you think, well, it's not obvious how you would measure that right? Uh, knowledge is not something easily quantified, but, but there's often an implication that 
you know, the key to being a successful producer in the old economy was, you know, to have more a bigger factory and more land and more machines and stuff and so on. But now the key to being a successful entrepreneur is to have more knowledge than other firms or to have better knowledge workers, this sort of thing. That maybe maybe this implies something different about marginal productivity or or the you know determinant of wages or something like that. Um, some of the discussion focuses on more technical aspects of production, so-called increasing returns to scale. It's claimed that you know when you're selling a network good, we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. Uh, you know, Facebook or Google Plus or whatever, where the value of having it depends on how many other people also have it. That it just sort of once a lot of people get it, there's sort of a tipping point, and then it explodes and it becomes, uh, uh, you know. It becomes cheaper to produce it on even a larger and larger scale, and so you end up with a few large firms that dominate the entire sector. You know, uh, Mises and Rothbard talk about the law of returns, the law of diminishing returns, meaning that uh, uh, in in the use of fixed factors, of of specific factors, when there are other factors that are complementary, you know, eventually the diminishing returns to a factor, uh, the returns to a factor diminish, go down, and that ultimately. Uh, production always takes place at the level of constant returns to scale. People have challenged that and said, well, maybe that doesn't apply anymore if you're talking about knowledge goods, information goods. Um, there's been some discussion about organizations, you know, that maybe the hierarchical firm is obsolete because uh, instead of having one, you know, l- these large organizations where managers tell other people what to do and so on, now everybody can be his own firm, right? A firm is just one guy with a laptop and sourcing his production from some place in China and, and outsourcing his distribution to FedEx and uh, you know, his payment collection, his finances to PayPal or whatever. And uh, we don't need firms with groups that are bossed around by bosses. Firms can be more decentralized or in the language of you know, management jargon, the hierarchy can be flattened. Um, what we want to ask today is, first of all, to what extent are these phenomena real? Uh, Do we have any evidence for the extent of these phenomena, for the magnitude of these phenomena? Have they been exaggerated, or is the discussion realistic? Uh, How important are they? Are they really something fundamentally new, or do they just represent small marginal changes over the way things more or less have always been? And, particularly uh, of particular interest for us this week, you know, do we need a new kind of economics to explain all this, or can we still use regular old old-fashioned economics. You know, does, does Menger and Bombavirk and Mises and so on, do these guys still have something for us to say, uh, something to say to us today? Are these theories still relevant or do we need a new economics? I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm being deliberately provocative in the way I pose these questions, but I'm not just, I'm not making this up as I go along. I mean, you know, there were a lot of books in the 1990s Late 90s, early 2000s, like this book by Kevin Kelly, who writes or wrote for Wired magazine. Some of you may have seen his stuff. You know, new rules for the new economy, essentially claiming that, well, scarcity isn't important anymore and decreasing returns aren't important anymore and so on. Uh, a more recent book by a couple of management uh, professors is called Wikinomics, you know, the economics of the Wikipedia world. They're focusing on you know, this idea that you can produce stuff with highly decentralized networks of individual volunteers, right? Just as Wikipedia is produced by, like just like an open source project uh, is produced, not by employees, but by volunteers who donate their time and there's no boss and it's, it's kind of a Hayekian spontaneous order, if you like. And so these guys wrote a whole book on, you know, the economics of the wiki world. We need a new wikinomics. Um, I'm not particularly enthusiastic about either of these two books. I present them to you as examples of the kinds of claims that people make. Um, Let's start with some facts, right? People sometimes accuse Austrians of being, you know, anti-empirical, but of course, the truth is really the opposite. As it came out in the advanced seminar that we had yesterday, um, I'll just ask, does anybody remember, not those of you who were there yesterday, what was Karl Menger's profession before he wrote the principles of economics and became an economics professor. Yeah, he was a journalist. He was a financial journalist. 
the equivalent of the guys you see nowadays on CNBC, you know, talking about what the what what happened in the corn market yesterday. That was what Menger did. He was used to explaining real world phenomena, and he developed his theory, uh, his theories uh, specifically to explain reality. That's why we used the term earlier in the week, causal realist, Austrian economics as a causal realist discipline. In fact, just as a footnote. One of the terms that was used to describe Menger's approach by his contemporaries uh, was the empirical school. Did you know that? Some people in that day called Menger's approach the empirical school, in contrast to Varaz and the mathematical economists who were des describing completely abstract hypothetical situations. No, Menger was describing real prices and real markets and real actors. So tell that to your friends who say Austrian economists aren't interested in empirical research. Uh, Menger was an empiricist by that standard. Anyway, so here are some facts. Here are some empirical facts. As good Mengarian journalists, we'll start with those. Um, it, it certainly is true by any objective measure that you know, what, what we might call the IT producing sector, hardware companies, software companies, telecommunications companies, and so on, uh, I mean, has grown dramatically in the last three decades, you know, measured by sales, measured by assets, measured by employees or whatever. So there's no doubt that the computer industry and the telecom industry and so on, those have grown rapidly. Um, there's also a lot of evidence that uh, the use of information technology by firms has gone up, right? I mean, if you ever you know, see pictures of, a, of an office from... 30 years ago, and you know, nobody has a computer on their desk, right? The diffusion of information technology into the workplace has been rapid and in many cases quite dramatic. So there's no doubt about that. Um, there's, uh, th there are many claims, so these are a little bit more difficult to substantiate, that the value of networks is greater than it was in the past, right? I mean, the internet itself, of course, as a network of networks, the value of which depends on the size of the network, right? That's the most obvious example of this phenomenon. But, you know, instant messaging and, and Facebook and so on are all examples, too, of so-called network goods. So people claim that, you know, the, the uh, ability to be successful as an entrepreneur, uh, the utility that consumers obtain and so on, in many cases is a function of their networks, the size and characteristic of the networks that they belong to. Now, this claim is a little bit more difficult to assess in terms of its magnitude and its novelty. Right? I mean, human beings have always been networked. That's Mises' very definition of society, right? Human beings who cooperate with each other by exploiting the greater productivity of the division of labor. So any group of individuals participating in the division of labor are part of a network. Okay, is it exactly the same as being part of a social network or a communications network like the internet? No, it's not exactly the same. But it, it, it's not as obvious what kind of numbers you would use to say networks are more important now than they were before. Um, there's some evidence that uh, private firms have increased the proportion of their budget they allocate to research and development, suggesting that maybe innovation is somehow more important than it was in the past. Um, there certainly is evidence of you know, some firms becoming smaller, flatter, more disaggregated. Um, you know, the importance of particular open source technologies is, is hard to overstate, right? Uh, so again, there's, the, the evidence on this one is not crystal clear, but certainly we do see some new forms of organization that, we didn't, that were less important or seemingly less prominent in the past. You know, there's lots of... Uh, uh, a lot of resources being devoted to new to startup companies and new projects. You know, the venture capital sector grew dramatically over recent decades. So there's been some important changes just in the last couple of years, um, or so-called angel investment: wealthy entrepreneurs who invest their personal resources in startup companies of newer, you know, younger entrepreneurs. Um, so the rise of the venture finance sort of early stage private equity sector is often taken as an argument for the new economy, that there is a new economy. And certainly that sector has grown. Um, and there are some new ways of doing business. I don't know if any of you saw the book by, um, wasn't Kevin Kelly, uh, 
gosh, I forgot, I think it was Chris Anderson who also writes for Wired called Free, claiming that, uh, you know, the way to make money nowadays in the, you know, in the IT business is to give stuff away for free, right? You know, Google gives all its products away to us for free and Facebook is free. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of most uh, instant messaging programs are free and so on. Uh, that in order to make money, you should give away most of your stuff for free and then try to sell some, ad raise money, money through advertising, maybe sell some ancillary products, you know, deluxe versions of things and charge money for that. But basically the way to get rich is to give away a lot of stuff to build up your, you know, your user base. That's an example of what people describe as a new business practice that wouldn't have been profitable 50 years ago, 100 years ago, but now it is. So the very way that firms do business allegedly has you know, sort of changed in a substantial way. Um, you know, it, it, just a, a little bit of, uh, here's a chart that gives you the flavor of the kind of things that people talk about when they have the new economy in mind. And this is data from the 80s and 90s. Um, so it's a little bit obsolete, but uh, the trends have, have more or less continued over the most recent two decades. I happen to have this chart handy. Um, you know, it's trying to measure, the, the, the curve that's going down is a price index showing kind of the real inflation adjusted price of computer hardware and software, right? So it's showing you that, you know, in real terms, the prices that we pay for information technology have gone down. And of course, we all recognize that, right? You know, one, uh, 20 years ago, you'd pay you know $2,500 for a PC that had you know 640k of RAM and two floppy drives and a monochrome screen. You know, now for three or four hundred dollars, you can get a machine that you know is more powerful than the fastest supercomputer that existed in 1990 or something. Uh, so we all recognize that the good stuff is getting cheaper in real terms. Okay. Um, these, these curves that are going up are showing investment in information technology by firms. How much, do they, how much computer equipment do they buy? Uh, how much telecommunications equipment do they use in their business and so on? Essentially what you see is, you know, the good stuff is getting cheaper and firms are using more of it. Okay, this is exactly what we would expect if we think that the, the, the IT sector is becoming bigger and more important and we're seeing a lot of technological progress and advance and so on, okay? But let me offer some qualifications, right? Being a good contrarian curmudgeonly type as, as we Austrians typically are, um, you know, is some of this hype? How much is hype and how much is reality? Well, first thing I wanna suggest is that um, Things that appear to be new are not always completely new, okay? People talk about the web. In fact, Gary North mentioned uh, in the debate with Walter Block, right, about, you know, everybody can have a YouTube channel, everybody can have their own WordPress site, everybody can have, you know, so-and-so.com, and you can write your articles and spread the word and so on. I mean, that is certainly true. But one thing that Gary didn't mention is, you know, the so-called long tail phenomenon. Do you know what they mean by the long tail? If, if you plot, you know, if you, if, you, if you look at all blogs and you rank them by the number of hits and then you plot it on a graph, there's a really steep drop off. Like there's a few blogs that get lots of hits, but then most blogs get like two hits a month or something, right? So it's true that anybody can try to get the word out, but it isn't true that everyone will be equally effective in doing so right, in terms of attracting readers. But the point is, this has been true for a long time, right? I mean, uh, a lot of important political movements in history, you know, the American Revolution in the 18th century was largely fueled by propaganda that was printed in these little pamphlets, or they called them handbills. Uh, once, with the advent of the printing press, where people could produce at low cost a large volume of little notes you know, denouncing the king or, uh, uh, you know, arguing for this or that, you know, Thomas Paine's common sense and so on. You know, these were not published by Oxford University Press and distributed in beautiful hardbounds. You know, these were little pamphlets that were mass produced, little flyers that were, you know, put on bulletin boards, so to speak, handed out at the local tavern and so on. So almost anybody could say something and try to attract a readership 
at, at pretty low cost. Anybody could stand on the street corner and shout out you know, his opinions and his views and try to get somebody to listen. So in a sense, you know, the cost of production or creating a newsletter, if you like, I mean, it is, it is lower now than it was in those days. It's, it's basically free, except for your time. But you know, this, is a quali- this is a difference in degree, not a difference in kind. Right. Likewise, okay, you know the internet. Of course, uh, it's hard to compare the internet to anything, but but people have compared it to older communications networks like the telegraph. Uh, the telegraph was introduced. Well, the the visual telegraph goes back to the 16th, 17th centuries. The electric telegraph of the Victorian era was considered in its day every bit as radical and revolutionary as the internet is considered in our day. I mean, think about it. In the 19th century, you go from you know, communication by stagecoach, giving a letter to a, a, a rider, and it would take a month to get from here to here, you know, to being able to send out mess, short messages in code almost instantaneously. I mean, think how radical that would have been. And since that's more of a radical change than when we went to calling somebody on the telephone to sending them an email. Um, we're already used to rapid communication, but that was unheard of in that day. And there were, there was, if you look at the newspaper articles of the time, you know, uh, speeches, books, people were saying exactly the same thing that they say now, that they were saying in the 90s. Oh my gosh, the whole world has changed. The globe has become smaller. Now we can all communicate with each other. We're part of one global community. You know, uh, people, and now war will end and everyone will get along and kumbaya and all that stuff. Um, there's, there's actually a fascinating book by a journalist named uh, Tom Standage. I, I forgot to get a picture of the book. It's uh, called The Victorian Internet. And it's about the history of this period. It's fascinating. He describes how, you know, telegraph enthusiast clubs emerged with their own lingo and their own way of dressing and talking. They had, you know, the equivalent of texting language. They had the LOL, you know, of Morse code and so on. And the same kind of culture that emerged among Internet geeks in the 90s is almost the exact same thing back in, you know, the 1860s, 1870s. Um, really very interesting. Um, what about, um, uh, you know, providing information? People say, well, you know, a web page, when, 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 you, when you purchase the services of an information provider, you're not buying a tangible good, you're just buying information, right? Using an online directory is consuming information rather than consuming a tangible good or service. Is that still a consumption good? Can we still, does marginal utility still apply to it? You know, this sort of thing. Well, I mean, information goods are not new either. I mean, the, tel- the, the telephone book, the phone book that you might have seen in your grandmother's house, you know, an actual book where you could look up phone numbers, that's an information good. Any, any book is an information good. You know, people who are buying the Gutenberg Bible were buying information, right? I mean, they were buying a tangible thing, but they weren't buying it for the, for the, for the paper, for its physical attributes. They were buying it for the information embodied within in the words. Um, what about things like the PC and you know, cell phone, uh, mobile phones, smartphones, instant messaging, and so on, where the rate of diffusion has been very fast, right? So a lot of attention is devoted to technologies that, that have this very rapid rate of diffusion. Like, I mean, you guys can probably remember when Facebook was new. I remember hearing about Facebook, I don't know, probably five years ago, and thinking, well, oh, this looks dumb. Poke, you know, what's the point of that? And, you know, I, I got on it because a, couple, a friend encouraged me to do so, but there was, I didn't know anybody else on it, and it was kind of useless. Then all of a sudden, there was a point, you know, I don't know, about three years ago, when all of a sudden everybody I knew was on there, and they were all posting pictures and jokes and stuff, and it's like, you know, now everybody's on it, right? There's probably one or two of you who are not on Facebook, and it's because you never will ever go on it, Right? And anybody who's ever going to get on Facebook is probably on it already. So it's like you go from almost no users to almost everybody using. And there's actually a a whole theory about this developed by a guy named Rogers in the 60s. I don't know if you've heard of the so-called S-curve. The the S-curve is supposed to describe adoption rates. I think I have another picture of the S-curve. Yeah, so the S-curve looks something like this. Here's, uh, Here's time, and here's the number of users. Right, so if you look at 
uh, sales of a particular product over time. You know, when the product is introduced, it doesn't have many sales, not, no, not many people want it, right? There are only the so-called early adopters, you know that term, and you probably know people like that. Whenever the newest gadget comes out, they have to be the first in line to get it, right? But most people don't. Most people wait a little while to make sure it's okay and to see what other people say and read the reviews and so on. So uh, eventually, the amount of sales per time period goes up. Then you reach a kind of a peak, and then it goes, it, it tails off, right? So something like, um, you know, think of a little, a slightly older technology like, you know, the Nintendo Wii. So I've got a Wii, right? I mean, I didn't buy the Wii right when it came out, but I, I was one of these people who bought a Wii here, and I don't think the Wii has much sales now because most people who are interested in a Wii have already got one. And nowadays, people want the next generation of thing, the you know, Xbox 360 or whatever it is. Um, if, you, if you plot the curve as cumulative adoption, so total number of users over time, it looks kind of like a letter S, right? So they talk about the adoption rate, you know, how steep is the adoption rate. Adoption is slow in the beginning, it really takes off, then it tapers off at the end. Uh, if you look at the introduction of the personal computer, the original PC in the 80s, it follows this kind of pattern. Uh, you know, social networks, uh, mobile telephony, uh, lots of communications technologies, lots of computer-based technologies have shown the same kind of uh, characteristic of very, very sudden and rapid adoption. But again, is that something brand new? A great chart that, I think it comes from Robert Gordon, um, plotted the adoption rate of a bunch of technologies going back to the early 20th century, including uh, electricity, uh, the refrigerator, electric refrigerator. Uh, here's the telephone. Uh, here's the, the video cassette recorder, the old VCR. Notice that they all have this kind of S-curve pattern, right? So when electricity is first introduced, not very many people have it. And a few homes begin to have it, and then all of a sudden everybody's got it. And you know, by what you know, about 1950, 1955, basically this is U.S. data. Basically, 100% of U.S. households have electricity, right? So within a span of just a few years, it goes from you know almost zero to almost 100%. Uh, look at the refrigerator. You know, in the early 1930s, only 20% of the population have a refrigerator, and then by you know 1960, it's almost 100%. So my point is, when a new valuable technology is introduced, it is often adopted very rapidly. It diffuses throughout the population very rapidly. This has nothing to do with it being an internet technology or a computer technology or even a communications technology per se. This is just the nature of innovation, at least in the 20th century. There's nothing new about this S-curve phenomenon that relates only to the internet or the so-called so new economy. Um, what about this, you know, what about open source? Uh, a technical term that is used by some writers, including uh, a law, uh, the, uh, one of the experts in this area is a guy named Benkler, Yokai Benkler, B-E-N-K-L-E-R. He uses the term commons-based peer production. What he means is that what is, you know, like in open source, the, the, the software code that is produced is part of the so-called commons if you've ever heard the phrase tragedy of the commons, right? Meaning property that is not owned by one specific individual or one precisely defined group of individuals. It's in the public domain, right? So they're producing commons, they're put, putting outputs in the commons, and it's produced you know, in a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized fashion. It's not designed from the top down with the boss, right? It's we, we it, open source programmers contribute their time and effort to put something in the commons. So is commons-based peer production the idea that individuals without any central authority cooperate with each other to produce valuable goods and services that provide benefits to many other people, including you know, far beyond those who actually provided all the inputs? Is that a brand new phenomenon? Sometimes I think, have these guys ever read I Pencil? Have they ever read Leonard Reed's classic uh, article from 1950? Uh, I think, do you remember Tom Woods last night was talking about the toaster? I Toaster? I mean, this is, economists are very familiar with this, uh, these kinds of examples. And the notion that the market system is itself 
a vast network of individuals who cooperate voluntarily, who contribute their time and energy into the production of goods and services that provide you know, vast benefits to, 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 to many, many people. So you know, commons-based peer production is just a fancy name for decentralized voluntary interaction, which is exactly what the market system is all about. Uh, we've had things like that ever since the beginning of human society. Okay. Um, uh, actually, I, I'm just going to go <coughs> talk about this very briefly. Um, wh wh what about you know, so-called information goods? What about buying and selling information as opposed to buying and selling stuff that you can touch? Isn't that different? Doesn't that mean different rules apply and demand curves maybe don't slope down anymore, maybe they slope up, or who knows? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, th think the answer is no. <laughs> that information goods do have some interesting characteristics, but they are basically economic goods just like any other economic good. Right, first of all, keep in mind that what is traded in the market is not information in some generic sense, but specific tangible units of goods and services. Right, you buy a book and there's information embodied in that book. You pay to listen to a lecture if you're purchasing, or maybe you get it for free. Um, you, you buy access to a network, uh, access to some information. Again, you're still buying and selling discrete units of goods and services in, in which information is embodied. But information is this you know, big amorphous thing. You don't buy and sell information. You buy and sell economic goods, right? And information goods are economic goods. Right? They're evaluated subjectively at the margin by rational thinking, choosing decision makers, just like a loaf of bread or, or, or whatever, an, an automobile. Okay? So information goods are not radically different in that sense. So if you go, want to go back to you know, Menger's analysis of, mar, of marginal utility, what determines the prices that consumers are willing to pay for the marginal unit of a good or service, and you know, you got five horses and you, the first horse is allocated to this use and the second horse to this less valued use and so on. You know that whole shtick, right? Well, it applies to information goods the same way that it applies to horses or loaves of bread or whatever else might be evaluated by the consumer, okay? Um, as I've already mentioned, information goods, you know, maybe in some sense they're bigger or more important or more valuable, but we've had information goods since the beginning of human civilization. Experts, guides, directories, dictionaries, um, you know, of course, books, lectures, uh, maybe, maybe music. I mean, listen, paying to hear a concert, you know, what, you're, what you're buying is, well, a particular pattern of tones. You, know, you can represent music as information. So uh, I mean, as long as people have been consuming music, they've been consuming information. Um, now, having said that, it is true that if you study some particular markets for information goods, they have some, they have some interesting properties. Uh, a, book, a, a good book that came out in the, I think about 98, 99, by uh, uh, Carl Shapiro and Hal Varian called Information Rules, described some of the you know, you know, kind of business strategies, pricing and, and uh, having different versions and things that uh, producers of information goods use to try to make money. And they're worth studying. I mean, there's a lot of insight that can be gained from that. One of the reasons they're interesting is because, you know, kind of the, the, the production technology for information is, it is often a little bit different from the production, productive technology for other things, right? Um, because, you know, with the book, the main, you know, the main input into writing the book is coming up with the ideas, right? Once you've written the manuscript and it's typeset, the cost to produce additional copies is very low relative to the cost to produce the first one, right? Same thing with, you know, computer code. Uh, the, the cost to Microsoft of, you know, producing Windows 7, you know, it's the development cost. It's the cost of writing the code. Once you have the code, the cost of stamping yet one more DVD to put on the shelf is, you know, almost zero, is, is, is trivial relative to the cost of producing the product in the first place. So how does a firm make money selling that type of good or service? Well, you, you, know, you, you need to, you want to be able to sell a, a sufficient quantity to recover that initial investment. 
right? And there may be ways that, that the firm can do this by applying innovative marketing strategies, pricing tactics, and so on. You know, th this idea of giving things away for free. Well, again, that's hardly a new phenomenon. Free promotions, you know, get people in the door. And in many ways, that's what uh, software companies do. Like Adobe, for example, they give away Adobe Acrobat for free, the Acrobat Reader for free, so that anybody can read PDF files. But if you want to produce your own PDF files, you either have to have an application that lets you save as PDF, or you have to buy the full version of Adobe Acrobat, which ain't cheap. You know, it costs you 100 bucks or something, right? So you give away one version of the product to try to help make it the dominant standard for that particular niche. And then you can make money by selling the full version or selling a complementary product or something like that, so-called two-part two pricing. Um, you may charge different prices to different kinds of users, so-called price discrimination. Um, it may be the case that there are substantial increasing returns in this kind of an industry such that there's an advantage to being first. There's a first mover advantage, and incumbents that are already dominant players in the industry have particular cost or pricing advantages relative to newcomers, right? I mean, that's certainly true of computer operating systems, right? Nothing prevents me, nothing, there, there's no legal restriction on my writing my own operating system for a PC and trying to compete head-to-head -head with Microsoft, but it's unlikely that I would be very successful because Microsoft already has the huge installed base it has the accumulated expertise and so on. So there's an advantage to being the incumbent. Not, that's not a praxeological necessity, right? But given the characteristics of these goods in these industries, it is often the case that incumbents have strong advantages. Again, is this brand new? No, of course not. There are many industries going back to the dawn of manufacturing, right, in which there are first mover advantages, incumbent advantages, and in which firms price discriminate and employ two-part pricing and so on. So we don't want to get carried away in saying that these are unique characteristics of the computer age in some sense, but they may be a little bit more important, a little bit more prevalent uh, than they were in the past. Um, what about so-called network effects? Or as the term is sometimes used incorrectly, network externalities. What, uh, what, what people mean by a network effect, that's just a fancy name for the attribute we discussed earlier, where the value of a network depends on the number of people in the network. And of course, th that makes sense, right? You, you don't want to be, you know, you don't want to be in a social network, you use a social network program that only has five users, right? Because there's nobody to network with. Um, so imagine somebody who, who was just getting into social networking for the first time, and they can choose between you know, Facebook, MySpace, and Google+. Plus. Um, you know, they might prefer Google+, Plus because they like its features, but it's more likely that they'll choose one of the networks that already has gazillions of users, one of the networks that all their friends uh, uh, are already on, right? Um, why is this important? Well, uh, in the 80s and 90s, a group of scholars came out with some research arguing that network effects cause problems in markets. The presence of network effects leads to so-called market failure. When network effects are present, we cannot be confident that markets will uh, uh, choose the appropriate technologies, the efficient technologies, the technologies that consumers desire. Right, and the most famous example that they used to illustrate their argument was the layout of the typewriter keyboard, the so-called QWERTY keyboard. Now, those of you from the US understand, you know, know that when you look at the typewriter keyboard, the top left-hand side of the first row has these letters, Q-W-E-R-T-Y. We call that the QWERTY layout. In some other countries, it's slightly different, but it's almost never, you know, there's no countries that have a standard keyboard layout that's A, B, C, D, or something like that, right? And you wonder, well, where did they get this weird typewriter layout? It seems totally illogical, right? Well, if you look at the history of typing, um, it turns out that in the early days of typing, there were a lot of different layouts that were sort of competing against each other. Now, according to the historian Paul David, who famously introduced this example into the economics literature, uh, what happened is, you know, th there was there were some sort of idiosyncratic random events 
in the 1920s, there were some typing contests where they, you know, see who can type the fastest with the fewest errors, and all sorts of different layouts were used. And one particular typist who happened to favor the QWERTY layout uh, won, won a contest and then won a few more contests and got a lot of press. And people mistakenly thought that this particular layout must be more efficient somehow than others. And new manufacturers began to adopt this layout. Now, according to David, the layout of a typewriter keyboard uh, is characterized by strong network effects, right? In other words, you could learn, you know, now you can program your computer to use whatever, you can you re reprogram your computer to use an alter alternate layout if you want. Most of the Windows even has built in the so-called Dvorak keyboard. Have any of you guys heard of Dvorak? That's a different layout that is supposedly faster and you can have fewer errors and less wear and tear on your pinkies or whatever. People say QWERTY is kind of, it seems inefficient because the pinkies do a lot of work with the shift keys and, and the thumbs don't do any work. The left thumb does nothing. All the right thumb does is hit the space bar. People say, well, that, that doesn't seem like an efficient use of the hands. So always attempts to redesign a more scientific version that, you know, more ergonomically correct version. Uh, but, you know, if you learn to type on something other than QWERTY, when you go to your friend's house, you can't use their computer unless you can reprogram it to your layout. Right? When you go to the coffee shop or the student lounge on your university, you can't use anybody else's computer but yours. Right? So there is value in learning the, the keyboard layout that most other people use so that you can switch from machine to she machine, other people can use your machine, and so on. So you might choose to use a particular typewriter layout, not because it's best in some objective sense, but because that's what everybody else uses. So according to these critics, if one particular technology, in this case the QWERTY layout, happens to get a little bit of a head start, and people believe for whatever reason that it's the one that most other people are using, then every, every newcomer will want to use that one too. And it just kind of expands and expands and explodes. There's a sort of a tipping point where all of a sudden everybody is using QWERTY. And even if somebody comes along with a new layout that's way better than QWERTY, the economy won't switch. The market won't switch because it's too difficult to coordinate getting everybody to switch at the same time. Right? You don't want to switch unless everybody else switches and, nobody, and everybody else is in the same position. Right? The term that was used to describe this uh, kind of case is path dependence. Path dependence is the idea, the simple idea that you know, where we are today depends on where we were yesterday. Duh. Right? So there's you know, we don't start anew every day. Our actions are a function of actions that we took in the past. As applied to technology markets, the argument is when network effects are present, the market will choose to, the market will tend to choose technologies that are not the most efficient technologies, but are the ones that just happen to get a head start for whatever idiosyncratic reason. Once we go down that path, we can't turn back. Right? We're stuck on the QWERTY path now, and no matter how much we would like to switch to something else, we can't. We're stuck on this path. We can't break out of it. Uh, the early literature on network effects and path dependence cited uh, the original VHS video recorder. Almost everybody here is too young to remember this, but when, the, when video recorders were introduced, there were two different kinds. There was VHS and Betamax, and a lot of uh, experts, industry experts, thought that Betamax was really better, was more sophisticated, higher quality, and so on, and yet the market converged on VHS and Betamax became an orphaned technology. Slightly more recent example of that you may remember is uh, Blu-ray versus the other high-definition formats, what was called HD DVD. There was a format battle when high-definition uh, uh, players were introduced, and after a few years of competing head-to-head, -head, Blu-ray won out, and HD DVD disappeared. Um, some of the literature e even claims that you know the kind of uh, you know uh, the DC power is really better than AC, but because some communities chose AC power, all of a sudden everybody was using AC power, and now we can't switch to DC. Uh, Paul David also claimed that actually the internal combustion engine. It was in automobiles as an inefficient technology, that it would have been better if we used steam engines 
Um, but unfortunately, the market chose you know gas gasoline powered internal combustion engines and, and instead of steam. So there's been literature on this. The reason anybody cares about it is because, according to the critics who introduced these ideas into the literature, they show that markets don't work. Right? Network externalities and path dependence represent a new and particularly important kind of market failure. We cannot trust the free market to choose technologies when network effects are present. Because the market may choose the wrong technology. And then we as a society are stuck. We're stuck using QWERTY. We're stuck with VHS. We're stuck with AC power. The implication, sometimes explicit, sometimes not, is that there should be a government planning agency that is responsible for choosing technologies, right? A body of disinterested experts will evaluate all the different keyboard layouts and will choose the one that's the best, and everyone will be required by law um, to adopt that particular technology, thus getting us out of this market failure trap. Um, is, this, is this true? Is this a good argument? Well, I mean, uh, there's several different ways to, uh, to approach it. One is to point out, of course, that it may very well be true that when we look back on choices that you know, we as individuals, that the market as a whole made in the past, we may have some regret. Now, gee, it would have been better if everybody had chosen the Dvorak layout in the early 20th century rather than the QWERTY layout. You know, if we knew then what we knew now, we would have chosen XYZ. Well, we didn't know it then, right? And we made the best choice based on the knowledge that we had at the time. The fact that we may later come to experience some ex post regret doesn't by itself prove that the process used to make the choice originally was flawed somehow. You'd have to come up with a feasible alternative. Now, do we think that a government planning bureau or an ind a committee of industry experts chosen undoubtedly through some bureaucratic rent-seeking process, is likely to choose better technologies on average? Um, or will those choices tend to be politicized, bureaucratized, influenced by special interests, and so on? Um, you know, if we would, if path dependence is a problem anywhere, it would seem to be a problem in politics, right? I mean, the person who has the political power is the guy who had it last year, and you know, we do things the way we always did them. Uh, because that's the nature of bureaucracy, right? We wouldn't expect a bureaucratic government organization to be more responsive somehow to technological innovation, to be more nimble, and to be less likely to get us locked into the wrong technologies. Um, but an even more powerful argument uh, that was first advanced by the economists Stan Leibowitz and Steve Margolis uh, in a famous article on the QWERTY keyboard is that the, the histor the, these historians basically have it wrong. Um, they claim that, the claims that the technologies that the market chose are worse than the alternatives available often turn out to be false, right? Uh, what they, they went and looked at the history of the typing industry and found that, in fact, it's true there were lots of different typewriter keyboard layouts in the early days of typing. And uh, they were all pretty much just as good. Um, in fact, even modern ergonomic experts say that there really isn't a big advantage in switching from QWERTY to Dvorak or something else, a supposedly more scientific alternative. Um, once you learn how to type quickly, a skilled typist can type about as fast on any keyboard layout. Th there are some differences in how quickly you learn the layout, but there aren't really any big advantages in switching to Dvorak. In fact, uh, when Paul David wrote his initial article uh, on uh, the, you know, the QWERTY phenomenon, he based his case on, on, on claims that, in fact, QWERTY is very inefficient, and that the Dvorak standard is 30% you know, increase in speed and 20% increase in accuracy, something like that. Well, it turns out that he based his argument on a Navy study uh, written in the 1950s on uh, typewriters, and the Navy study was written by Mr. Dvorak, the guy who was trying to sell his typewriter to the Navy, right? So if you, if you look at the evidence more carefully, it's not at all clear that there's anything wrong with QWERTY, first of all. The other thing is, uh, you know, what constitutes an efficient or inefficient technology 
Remember, from the economist's point of view, the better technology is the one that consumers prefer, right? Is the one that allows consumers to satisfy their wants better than the alternative technology. It doesn't mean the technology that engineers think is better or that you know, experts in the industry think is better. Like, for example, with VHS and Betamax, the, the claim that, the, that Betamax was really the better technology, this is really an engineering claim. So uh, the, the facts are that the, uh, the, the Betamax cassettes were smaller, they were more compact than the VHS cassettes, and there was a higher, uh, the picture quality was higher with Betamax rather than VHS. But the Betamax recorders were much more expensive than the VHS recorders, and the recording time was shorter. Uh, you could only, only record for, uh, I think, 15 minutes on one Betamax cassette, and you could record for 30 minutes on a VHS cassette. Uh, and then, you know, they had different ways to expand that, where I think now you can record like up to six hours on a VHS cassette, if they still even make them. Um, so consumers were evaluating, you know, would I rather have a more compact cassette that's higher quality, but it costs more, the machine costs more, and it can't record as long? Or would I rather have a lower quality system that is a lot cheaper and allows me to record for a longer period of time? Well, I mean, there's no ex ante way to say which of those is you know, better. But you know, consumers voting with their dollars decided that they preferred the cheaper machine with the longer recording time. And the fact, that, the fact that some experts say, well, the Betamax was really a more technologically elegant solution. Well, who cares? I mean, that's not what the market selects for. The market doesn't select for technical elegance. The market selects for what consumers like, what consumers want. Um, I don't know if you, any of you saw the, uh, uh, if you followed this stuff, but there was a, the company that makes BlackBerry, Research in Motion in Canada, has uh, fallen on hard times. Uh, stock price has gone way down. People think the company may eventually die and so on. Uh, a few weeks ago, there was an open letter published, shared in the technology press by a, an executive with Research in Motion saying, you know, complaining about upper management and all the things that were wrong with the company. One of the points he made was, uh, this anonymous letter writer made, was that RIM was focusing on you know, marketing to consumers all of the technological advantages that it had, which consumers didn't care about. For example, the, uh, the, the new tablet that RIM makes, the BlackBerry Playbook, you know, they say, we have Flash. Because as you know, the, I the iPhone and the iPad cannot run Flash. And this letter writer was saying, you know, Consumers don't care about that. They want to know, what can I use it for? Uh, how does it work? Do I like it? One of the letter writers, a follow-up letter writer, said something like, you know, my, my mother doesn't care if it's HTML6 compatible. She just wants to know if she can play Angry Birds on it. Okay? <laughs> and you can't play Angry Birds on the BlackBerry device, even though it's more sophisticated, according to the engineers. Right? The market doesn't care about that. Consumers, pre consumer preferences are not to be judged ex post by engineers as being, you know, right or wrong. Okay, so I think we should not worry about network effects being a source of market failure. In fact, thinking about this carefully simply reinforces our belief that um, uh, that politicized decision making is more likely to cause error and problem than market based decision making. Okay, um, I want just a, a brief remark about the internet. This is a whole subject in itself. And in fact, if you had taken my Mises Academy course last year, you could have gotten many lectures on the economics of the internet. And hopefully, Doug French will offer that course again so the students can uh, uh, get a chance to hear, this, uh, to hear this stuff in more detail. Um, I've actually written a couple of articles on this, too, that um, the internet makes for a fascinating sort of case study. Um, on the one hand, you know, there is vast decentralization on the internet. Right, uh, you know, millions of people can you know can link in and, and can create software and, and different products and even the hardware and so on, and uh, you know the internet's relatively unregulated compared to other parts of the commercial world, uh, and it's you know the, the and it's thrived and a lot of people uh, sort of uh, free market proponents have said the rise of the internet demonstrates how a decentralized 
you know, free market sort of order can function. It shows the superiority of free markets over central planning and so on. Now, I don't disagree with those claims, but I, I'm a little bit more circumspect than some of my colleagues in, in you know, pointing out, in using the internet as a shining example of decentralized, bottom-up, market-based, spontaneous order, to use Hayek's term. But certainly, the, the modern internet does, it is a kind of spontaneous order, but Remember that the underlying technologies of the internet, the basic communications protocol, and what they call IP, you guys, you know, everybody, you know the idea of having an IP address. Well, IP stands for internet protocol. That's, you know, the system that assigns the, the numeric addresses to different devices that are connected to the internet. There's also a protocol for exchanging the little pieces of information, the little packets that go back and forth which is called Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP. So this, uh, the, the internet is based on the so-called TCP IP standard, a set of rules for how different devices across the internet will connect, communicate with each other, and so on. How bits of information will be passed along from one server to another server, or from one router to another router, and so on. Um, those technical standards did not come from the market. Right? They came from the state. Um, remember that the internet has its origins in a Defense Department project in the 1960s, the so-called ARPANET that came out of the U.S. government's Advanced Research Projects Agency, or Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, that makes all the super, you know, secret spook, spook stuff. Um, uh, and it was originally designed to provide a secure communications infrastructure in the event, in the event of a nuclear war. The reason that the designers adopted this kind of decentralized web-like structure where there's no one central point, no central node that could be taken out by the enemy is precisely to allow different military bases to communicate with each other even in the event that the Russians were to take out Washington, D.C. or something like that. So the Internet is not a hub-and-spoke network like Federal Express, right, where all the packages go through Memphis. There's no central node with the internet, it's a, it's a loosely structured web, and that was a deliberate design by its designers to facilitate robust, secure military communications. Uh, there were also academic users, research computing users, who wanted the ability to log in remotely to server computers located at other uh, sites and so on. But it was, the point is it was government, it was the Defense Department, and it was university researchers uh, on government grants, uh, people with the RAND Corporation and so on, who designed all these early protocols. And the structure of the current internet, the way the internet operates today, is still, in a sense, builds on the legacy of these early designers who were not market actors you know, making choices in anticipation of satisfying consumer wants. Um, uh, there's a quote that I really like from a document, so-called netbook, that's sort of an informal open source history of the net, history of the internet. And this one passage I think is particularly insightful. According to the author, uh, the current global computer network has been developed by scientists and researchers who were free from market forces, who were free of market forces. Because of the government oversight and subsidy of network development in the 60s and 70s, uh, these network pioneers were not under the time pressures or bottom line restraints that dominate commercial ventures. Heaven forbid, right? Therefore, they could contribute the time and labor needed to make sure the problems were solved. In other words, according to this historian, you know, what's good about the internet is that its designers were free from the constraint that what they des designed had to satisfy consumer wants. Right? They could play. They could do what they thought was neat and cool and what they as engineers thought was most effective and so on. Thank goodness, according to this, uh, these kinds of, uh, this line of thought, thank goodness that capitalism didn't rear, you know, stick its ugly nose into the early development of the internet. Now, does that mean that there's something, we shouldn't use it or that you know, there's something wrong with the internet? Oh, of course not. Markets are very good at taking what is given to them and making it work the best way that it can. But we should not be naive 
in forgetting that the underlying technologies, which may not be as good for us as the technologies we wish had been chosen, uh, were the result of you know, state actors. So to conclude, uh, you know, the information technology does have some interesting and oftentimes unusual characteristics that are worth studying. Uh, information goods, uh, network effects, and so on are important, but they're not fundamentally new. Nor do we need you know, new, a new kind of economics to explain them. We, we need not replace the downward sloping demand curve, I copied this from Man, Economy, and State, with an upward sloping demand curve or something else that, uh, 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 you know, a, a new kind of Austrian economics that replaces the old. No, good old conventional causal realist Austrian economics is as good as ever. So thank you.